Well, thanks very much for coming. I know it's, uh, it's kind of a bit compressed and back to back. Um, I was asked if I wanted to come to do this conference to talk about uh, how we use JFrog uh, to manage the spring release process. Uh, and I, I thought to myself, well, it's probably only a 10 minute talk. So I'm, I wasn't really sure. Um, and then they said it was going to be in a winery in Napa. So I thought, well, I can, I can probably stretch this out a bit and, and talk about a bit more than just JFrog. Um, so this talk is about the complete uh, release process that we have with Spring, and also the kind of wider community and the way that we manage the ecosystem. So uh, I don't know if you've seen this little graphic before. This is apparently how they made the MGM logo. Um, <coughs> I think in reality it's not. I think that line's from a, a CAT scan image and someone's got some good Photoshop skills, but uh, you get the idea. So this talk, I've got three parts to it. I'm going to discuss briefly the Spring team itself. Then I'm going to talk about the community. And then the final part is the bit that they probably wanted me to talk about, which is the, the JFrog release process that we use and the tools that we use. So for those that don't know me, my name is Phil Webb. I work for a company called Pivotal. I work on the open source projects, Spring Framework, and more recently, Spring Boot, which is a fairly new project. Um, so before I get going, I want to give you a quick demo of Spring Boot, because I think it helps set the scene. Um, and it shows you that Spring Boot's got a slightly different release process to a lot of the Spring projects. So with Spring Boot, we've got um, a couple of different ways of using it. So one of them is to you can install it on a, a command line tool which you can install if you're on a Mac using brew. So if you do brew, ins uh, brew install Spring Boot, uh, I've, got, I've already got it installed here, but you'll get a little command line tool. So Spring, oh yeah, sure. Better, can you see? Yeah, okay. So Spring, um, I say it's slightly unusual. In, in most of the Spring libraries are, are released as jar files, but Spring Boot is actually released as both a jar file and something you can run. So if I wanted to write a Spring Boot project, um, I can write it in Groovy. Uh, I can just, for instance, do a little REST controller. I know, I know. I, you, you're making me nervous here. I was thinking, I, my groovy skills are not, not great, but so I tend to write Java <laughs> without the semicolons. <laughs> um, but this gives you a little example of the type of thing you can, you can do. So uh, request mapping, and then. I nearly did the semicolon. <laughs> so this is like a little Spring Boot app that you can run with that command line tool. So I can do spring run app.groovy. And that will actually compile that Groovy code, um, start up Spring, download the jars, and give me a little running application. Uh, so by default, it opens on port 8080. So that gives you like a quick example of one way of using it. And perhaps the more common way that people use it um, is with a, a Java type build system. So if you want to use Java, uh, we have a little service that you can use called start.spring.io. Uh, so if I make that a bit smaller, you can see here there's just a, basically a whole bunch of different ways of using the app. And if I do this curl example here. It will download a zip file to get me going. So here's the same file imported into Eclipse. And I've got a little application and that same kind of REST controller thing as before. And the important thing here is that this is a, uh, you can use Gradle or Maven, but this is a, a Maven build. So you can see here we're pulling in specific dependencies which are coming down from Maven Central. So um, that's kind of a very brief overview of Spring Boot. Um, but I really wanted to talk more about the kind of general Spring process it, uh, as a whole. 
So if you want to have a look at who's in the Spring team, you can go to spring.io slash team, and you'll get a little page of where we are and uh, who's in the team. The, the thing that's kind of unique about Spring is, um, certainly within Pivotal, is that we're a very distributed team. So we tend to work from home. Uh, we're all over the globe. Um, we're kind of self-organizing. And normally, there's about two to four developers on any one project at any given time. So Spring Boot currently has about three people on it. So we're, we're very small. Um, so small that really to actually uh, manage the open source, we need help. We can't um, do this thing on our own. We don't have a QA team. Uh, we don't have a kind of dedicated test team. We don't have a, a lot of um, uh, resources. So we have to rely on the community quite a bit. And that means we really need to get engagement. So this is a little screenshot of GitHub's Spring Boot project. And you can see that we've got uh, almost 2,000 forks of the project and 141 individual people have actually contributed to it. So that's when you consider the size of the team, that's really good numbers. Uh, if you look at Spring, so the Spring Core Framework, this has been around for a long time. So there actually have been uh, not currently open, but there have been, in total, almost 13,000 issues raised against Spring. Um, they're not all bugs, so <laughs> I'm not trying to say it's a bad thing. In fact, it's a really good thing, because that's uh, 13,000 people that have decided that they've got something to contribute, even if it's just recording you know, an issue or an improvement or a suggestion. So really, our aim. Uh, when it comes to, to getting people involved is to try and make it as absolutely as painless as possible to both contribute code, uh, documentation, and to test any fixes that we might, um, we might do with the framework or the projects ourselves. So this is the current stack that we have. We have um, all the code is open source, all hosted on GitHub. Then Depending on the project, we'll either have Jira issues or GitHub issues. So Spring Framework uses Jira, because it's, mainly because it's been around longer. Um, Spring Boot uses GitHub issues. I personally, um, so Jira is a lot more powerful, I think, but GitHub issue tends to get a lot more engagement. So I find that GitHub issues is probably enough. And then in terms of actually building the project, we have a Bamboo um, CI server. And then our binaries are hosted on Artifactory, which is provided by JFrog. And then finally, we have the kind of actual release release binaries, which get pushed to Bintray and onto Maven Central. In terms of the builds, we use um, each project can choose what they want. I say we're kind of self organizing, but most of the projects choose either Maven or Gradle. And I think both have strengths and weaknesses. I, I have a Hate, hate relationship with build systems. They tend to always fail at the worst possible time. Um, so Spring Boot uses Maven. Spring Framework uses Gradle. And I think, you know, use what works for you. So I want to go over some kind of common scenarios that people might, might do with our projects. Probably the most common is, uh, I found a, a bug, I found an issue, your code sucks, and I need to kind of report it to you. So you might think that, that uh, an issue getting reported is just, um, you know, it, you raise an issue, it gets reported, someone fixes it, everything's great. But there tends to be a lot more of a kind of backwards and forwards than that. Um, so I don't know if you've ever searched for a problem with a library or an open source bit of code that you've been using. And I tend to find I either end up at Stack Overflow or I end up at an issue tracker. And so making our issue tracker um, useful as a resource that people can search is, is very beneficial. So one of the things that I tend to do quite a lot is actually just format the, uh, the commit message. So actually the format the message of the, uh, of the issue. So apply markdown formatting, use um, you know, the, the appropriate syntax highlighting, that kind of thing. The next thing that we almost always need to do is reproduce the issue. And again, that um, can vary depending on the type of problem that you've got. If it's just a you know, typo or documentation issue, obviously that's pretty easy. 
Uh, but for a lot of code issues, we tend to either want to write a unit test immediately that fails that, so that we can fix it. Um, but quite often, we have complex interplay with, with various different libraries that we use and various different projects. So it tends to be sometimes hard to isolate things down to a single unit test. So what we have with Spring is we have what we call issue projects. So they're top level GitHub repositories. Um, so there's like a Spring dash boot dash issues that people can submit pull requests against that allow us to kind of run their code and see what the actual problem is. And this has been one of those things that I think has been really beneficial for the project because as soon as you ask people to try and create something to reproduce their, their issue, um, quite often you find that the steps they go through to actually isolate the pieces of code that they think of, they've got a problem with will highlight the problem itself. And it may not be our code that's the, that's the issue. Then we tend to label and target bugs. So we tend to pick, uh, I, I can show you a quick example of this. So here's the Spring Boot project. If we look at the issues, um, you can see we have a whole bunch of labels. Uh, OK, so we have a whole bunch of labels that provide kind of us a way of managing the issues because we get so many that it's, it's kind of hard to keep track. So if it's an enhancement request, we can tag it appropriately. Uh, blockers are things that we think are necessary to fix for the next release, bugs, and uh, probably the most important one for us is regressions. So if we have a regression, we treat that very seriously. And then we also get a lot of people asking things that should be in Stack Overflow. So we tend to tag those and then try and persuade people to move over to Stack Overflow if they're asking a kind of general question rather than um, actually raising a bug. And then as far as the um, milestones we, we have with Spring Boot, we have Master, which is like the next upcoming version. And then we have a couple of uh, branches that are ongoing. So we have a kind of active version and a maintenance mode version. So we tend to... Um, uh, try and try and have a fairly short lifespan between between active versions so that we can transition people on. And then the kind of final step, the final thing that we actually need to do is fix the issue. <laughs> and fixing the issue. Um, again, it's is kind of interesting. Even if you write yourself a unit test, and even if you can get that unit test to pass, or if the, um, if the person's been kind enough to submit a pull request to the issues project and you can get that to work, it's still often very helpful to kind of go back to the original um, person and say, can you try the latest snapshot um, before we release it to make sure that it's actually really fixed your problem? And this is how, uh, this is one of the parts of the JFrog stack that we use to do that. So, we have the Bamboo and Artifactory plugin doing our continuous integration. And then each of uh, the snapshot builds that we produce is pushed into a public um, binary Artifactory repository that people can actually use. So if they want to test the latest release, if they're using the, the kind of Java ecosystem, they just have to add an extra line to their Gradle build or an extra five lines to their Maven XML, and they can download and test um, the snapshot version, and that's, that's really helpful. So I was, I was originally just going to skip on from bugs to code, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the documentation, because this is one thing that we found has really improved um, within the kind of last year. So we used to use this technique of generating the documentation called docbook, which was just a hideous mess of XML. And recently, we switched both uh, the Spring Framework and Spring Boot from the, from the get-go. Uh, we wrote the documentation in a project called ASCII Doctor. 
So if you look at the docs uh, website for docs.spring.io, you'll see the formatted documentation looks something like this. It's available as HTML. Um, you can also download PDFs or EPUB versions. Um, but the benefit of the ASCII Doctor project is if you look at the source code for this, it's actually quite readable. Um, so this is the exact same page uh, here in ASCII Doctor source. And if you look at it on GitHub, uh, GitHub will render it like Markdown. So it's also really readable and easy to understand. So this has really helped with the, uh, the number of documentation fixes that we've had. So we've had lots of people just um, reading the docs, obviously trying to learn a new project, learn a new product, and finding some kind of grammar error or something small or you know, a typo in the code example. And they've just been able to go straight to GitHub, fork the repo, read the documentation source, and change the bits they want, and send a pull request in. So if you're, um, if you're inside your own organization and you've got to write documentation, I really recommend you have a look at um, ASCII Doctor. Another nice feature that we do uh, that I, I don't know if many people here. So who here is a developer? Who here is like an actual developer? OK. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I guess everyone's using Artifactory since it's a JFrog conference. OK. So uh, do you use properties, the, uh, the kind of extra metadata with Artifactory a lot? So we, um, we use a property, uh, a couple of additional properties, and then we have a, uh, a Perl script that someone wrote sometime in the, in the past uh, that runs on a regular basis. So I don't know if you can see it, but here we have zip.deployed and zip.type. So if this script sees a docs type and a deployed of false, then it will um, co uh, copy the zip file down, unpack it in the appropriate place, and then set deployed to true so it doesn't do it again and again. And then our documentation is actually just a straight static serving of content using Apache HTTPD. Um, but again, this means that it's just something we don't need to worry about. You can commit a piece of change and then you know, sometime later, the HTML documentation uh, comes up on the website, and so if you go to the if you go to docs.spring.io, so you can see each project normally has a release version of the reference manual, and if you skip, like if you go up a level, you can see that each version that we have. Um, is released with its own documentation. So you can find documentation that was relevant for the version you're using. And we also have snapshot documentation. So if we're in the middle of changing something, uh, we can, for instance, when we're developing a feature ourselves, we often update the docs and then go and have a quick look once it's been deployed to make sure that it's actually rendered correctly. This is uh, the trick that we use with um, Spring Boot. So if you're using Maven, actually getting that extra metadata can be a bit of a pain. Um, and we discovered a little hack that works. I'm not sure if it's something that I'd recommend, but it, it works. Uh, if you put, so this is uh, a Maven goal to attach an adi additional zip file. And normally the type here would be just zip. But if you put this extra set of metadata at the end, um, it actually, when it uploads the file, Artifactory actually recognizes it, and it ends up coming through as, um, uh, as those properties. I think, it's a, I think it's a kind of happy coincidence that it works, but it does work at the moment. So really, the, the final utopia for where we want to get to is where people are not just contributing documentation fixes, but actually helping us fix or add features to the code. And um, again, the idea behind helping people is to, is to make that process as seamless and easy as possible. So for all our projects, we try and have uh, single click builds. So even if uh, people are using Gradle or Maven, we try and get it to the point where if they want to actually get working on the code, they can clone a repository, type one command, and then get a fully working build up and running. Another thing we do is always have uh, contributing instructions. So all of our projects have a contributing readme file 
that, that gives people kind of detailed instructions of how to get started. And I think these things can be very beneficial even if you're not working on open source because you, you, know, you have people coming and going on projects, new, new people starting, or people that have been away for a while. So just having a kind of quick way of getting going and spending the time to make that process as seamless as possible uh, really helps. Another thing that we do, which is perhaps a little bit controversial, is uh, trying to minimize the formatting pain that people might have. So I've worked on both Spring Framework and Spring Boot. And they have, both projects have slightly different approaches. Spring Framework is manually formatted. And uh, with Spring Boot, we actually completely auto format it. So as soon as you save the file in Eclipse, the, the file is kind of reformatted to our style. But both have a kind of project-specific configuration within Eclipse that lets people kind of check out and get going with the code and at least get 90% there with the way they're going to work. So with, uh, with Spring Boot, this is the Maven configuration. Uh, I just put it up here if you want to. I'll put the slides on the um, slide share afterwards, and you can have a look if you want to. But it's basically a couple of lines of configuration saying copy these files to a certain place. And then we have an additional uh, plugin that you can install into Eclipse that will automatically apply that to your project. With Gradle, it's a bit simpler, uh, but the same kind of process. We have a couple of files that get copied to a certain place when you run the Gradle Eclipse task. Um, I'll give you a quick demo of that, because I think it kind of helps show what I mean. So here I've got a checkout of Spring Boot as it comes up. So you can see if I like jump into a bit of code, uh, we have like a very particular style of formatting. We have a copyright header on every file. Uh, we have tabs and not spaces, etc. We have wrapping at um, 90, 90 characters. So if I was to like be just you know imagine I'm someone who's just come on starting working on the project. So if I create like a new you know, sample feature, whatever. So you can see already when you just create a new file, you kind of you've got some guidelines. You've got the author tag, so they're kind of you know encouraged to add an author tag. We've got the copyright header, um, but more than that, if I add like some some code, So you can see, as soon as I save that file, we have a whole bunch of things that just happened for us automatically. So uh, you know, the privates are prefixed with this, the tabs are spaced, the formatting's done, uh, the spaces between the if, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see this kind of, um, I think this auto formatting really helps to at least get us to the point where pull requests are kind of 90% the way we would have done it ourselves. So just because someone sends us a pull request with some code doesn't mean that we're likely to just merge it as is. Um, we almost always go through a kind of process of refactoring code, adding tests, uh, changing the formatting slightly, sorting out commit log messages. And this process is kind of iterative. We also use the same process internally. So we will often use a pull request for a feature that we want to add to the project ourselves that maybe is a bit controversial, or maybe we just want a bit of an opinion from other developers. So we tend to use pull requests to manage things you know, internally. Um, something that I think is often overlooked when it comes to uh, development in general is the power of the commit log message. So commit log messages for us are an absolutely amazing debugging tool. It's quite often the case that I will have a regression or a problem to solve, and I'll look at the history of a file, and if I've got a decent commit message that tells me why a particular line was changed, it gives me much more confidence to know why it was there and how I can fix it. So if you're using Eclipse, you can do <coughs> a team show annotations, which will give you a little guide in the ruler. 
If you're using the command line, you can do git blame, which will give you a view of one file and who's changed each line. Or if you want the history of one particular file in git, you can do git log dash dash and then some specific file. So what I mean by a decent commit message is something that, that is consistent. Um, and also something that what we like to do is try and tell a story. So try and give people enough information with the first line uh, to understand things, and then a detailed description, and then finally maybe a reference to an issue number, uh, something that makes sense to them. I've put a couple of links on this um, slide that I think are worth reading. These are two articles that describe how you can write a decent commit message. These are the rules that we follow. So the first line is always capitalized. It's 50 characters or less. The second line is always blank. Uh, the commit message is normally quite lengthy, often longer than the code that we change. It hard wraps at 72 characters. We always use the, for, the form uh, fix bug, never fixing or fixed. And then the last thing we do is reference an issue number. And the reason we do all this is because if you, if you follow those rules, you'll find that your commit logs look good in virtually every environment. They look good on the terminal. They're easy to read in the IDE. They even look good on github.com. Um, and also the constraints that you put on yourselves. If you can't describe your commit message in the first 50 characters, then there's a high chance that you perhaps want more than one commit message, and more than one commit. So this is, I don't expect you to read this, but this is a, a little snippet of the Spring Boot commit logs. So again, you can see how um, we're pretty consistent in terms of uh, how they're formatted. If you want to, um, well, one of the benefits, I think, of Git that's perhaps not well understood when you first start with it is that it gives you the chance to refactor your commits in the same way that you would with your code. And changing history in Git is a, a very powerful feature. So if you want to change uh, the commit log message, which is what we tend to do most often, then git commit dash dash amend will let you change the last thing. If you've got code changes but your message is good, uh, you can use the no edit flag. Uh, and another thing that we often do is give author attribution to commit messages. So although I, am, as a user of Git, can change code, I can attribute the change to someone else if I want to. So quite often we maybe will refactor code and um, uh, you know, work on a pull request. But we still want to give the person who originally submitted that pull request the correct attribution in the, in the history and uh, you know, get those contributor figures going up. So if you use dash dash author, you can actually set the code to make it look like someone else has done it. And the final one that I'm not going to cover in any detail, but I recommend you go and read about, is git rebase-i, which is interactive rebasing, which is really the daddy of kind of changing commit messages. OK, so this is really the part of the talk that they probably wanted me to come for. Uh, this is the bit where we actually talk about how we release Spring. <clears throat> so with Spring, we are not, uh, you know, we're not a website. We're releasing bits. We're releasing things to a, a place where they're going to be available forever. So we don't, we don't do continuous delivery as such. So we have a two-stage process. We always put things into a staging environment first. And then we move from staging uh, through promotion to the actual kind of released version. So staging just gives us an extra um, way of sanity checking what we've done. So our staging environment has kind of been covered already. We've got Bamboo as the continuous integration server, Artifactory um, acting as our binary holder staging environment. And then for releases, we push up to Bintray. And Bintray then forwards things onto Maven Central, which is still the way that most of our users consume things. For the release process, it's much like uh, was discussed in the keynote this morning. We actually have a little plugin provided by Artifactory that sits in with our Bamboo server. And we just have to fill in a form and then click a button. And we try and, like most of what Spring does, we try and follow a kind of 80-20 rule. So 80% um, of the release is painless. 20% <laughs> for us is, is still a little bit painful. But at least the, the kind of the bulk of it is, um, 
is done on our behalf. So the 80% that Bamboo and Artifactory does is uh, create the release branch, uh, run that branch, run the tests for that branch, and build it, then tag it in Git, uh, then stage the binaries in Artifactory, and then upgrade them, the branch or the master version, to the next uh, version that we're going to work on. For the 20%, which is kind of still the pain, which I think we can't really automate too much of this, but we have um, so a few sanity checks that I tend to do. So I tend to run the, the boot jars against some real world applications because the tests that we have, you know, whilst we get good coverage, you never quite get the same confidence as you do with running a real app. And I quite often run the spring.io website app. So spring.io is an open source project. And if you want to look at the source for our actual website, it's a Spring Boot application that you can download and try. So I tend to use that as a sanity check. Uh, then I obviously check documentation, make sure that looks sensible. Again, something you can't really automate. The homebrew recipe that we, um, that we have to provide in order for Mac users to install the command line tool, uh, we actually generate that and push it into Artifactory, but then there's a process that I have to go through to download that and push it somewhere else. So that's still a manual process at the moment. And then finally, the promotion is just click a button and things go up to Bintray and onto Maven Central. Uh, I said Sagan is open source, so if you want to actually see a, a real world Spring Boot application, you can go and download the source for that. And that's, uh, that project actually feeds the start.spring.io thing that we saw this, the first thing. So the last step that I have to do is update the version number in that. So I mean, if I was to summarize things, I think that there's a lot of good techniques that open source projects use. Uh, they probably don't get talked about that often, but you can certainly go and steal things that they use because you know everything they do in terms of the code is open, so you can look at their build scripts. Try and reduce that getting started pain, so get it so that your users can get up and running quickly. Use Git branches internally, even if you don't use GitHub, you can still use Git branches to iterate on things. Have a staging and rollback strategy. So our strategy is to, to push the bits up to that staging environment, and then if things don't work, roll back and start again. Uh, other continuous delivery environments might opt for a kind of always pushing forwards and roll back at the code level, but still having that ability to, to take what you've done and go, oh no, and roll back is very important. And then finally, invest, um, even if it's not financially, invest the time in the tools that you're going to use, because things like the, the binary artifacts uh, Artifactory, bin tray, make a huge difference to um, the way that you actually run your project. And that's me. If anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to. I don't know how long. How long have I got? Two minutes. Two minutes right? I've got two minutes and two drink tokens. So, <laughs> any questions? <laughs> no. Nope. Going once. Um, so the question is, how do we ensure that commit messages are, are formatted that way? Yeah, um, that is actually one of, the, um, one of the pain points. For pull requests, it's very easy because we can reformat the message ourselves. F within the team, it's a bit more complicated because <laughs> if people aren't doing it, it's too late. And actually, if you go back to that, um, this one, you may notice that some of these, these are actually more than 50 characters. <laughs> um, So the key comment is that you're, you're saying that um, 
enforcing this thing on the user is not really fair. Standards for something about format that enforce it at data entry. Yeah, I, it's, it's very difficult to do. Um, I mean, our, our policy is, is to be relaxed about it. If people submit pull requests for us, we're more than happy. That's fantastic. We will fix up the commit message. It's just internally. And a team of three, it's pretty easy to manage. I guess in 20, it's, it's getting them. Yeah, hooks may be an answer. But um, it tends to be a bit more gray than that. Yeah. OK, I think, that's, I think we're getting shoved out. So thank you very much. <laughs>